we are going to take a look at one of the most fascinating individuals in, in American history and perhaps any history, a man who was a walking contradiction, uh, an individual who proved to be the idol of uh, past president Donald Trump. And when we go through Jackson, you'll see how he and Trump fit together like a hand and a glove. Andrew Jackson, a man whose face is on, uh, I believe it's the $20 bill, and a man whose face they all want to want to get rid of. Old Hickory, as he was known as, uh, was the people's president. He was an individual who was idolized by the American electorate, who could have been elected again and again and again, but chose only to run uh, for two terms. Actually, he ran for three, but lost the first time. Uh, he comes into the American presidency at a time when there are some dramatic uh, yet subtle changes taking place. He is going to elevate politics uh, to a level which we had not seen before. He makes it very personal. He makes it uh, very political in that everything that he proposes, he makes sure that it's going to be beneficial to him and his political fortunes. And if anybody stood in the way of that, then they automatically became his enemy. He was almost immune to compromise. And it's these uh, tactics, it's these characteristics, which in, in a strange way, oftentimes endeared him to the American people. And even though a disaster resulted uh, because of some of his policies, the American people still uh, held him in great regard. As a matter of fact, when the Civil War was about to uh, break out across America, there were people in the election of 1860 who voted for the now dead president, hoping that he would come back and end this crisis. So let's take a look at Andy Jackson. Andrew Jackson, the seventh president of the United States, spent much of his life serving as a military officer, where he waged war against Great Britain, Spain, and American Indian tribes. It was his victory over the British in 1815 at the bloody Battle of New Orleans that made him a national hero. Andrew Jackson's influence on U.S. politics was so great that historians call the period of his presidency the Jacksonian democracy. Jackson and his campaign organizers founded the Democratic Party, a political party that attracted voters by praising the virtues of ordinary working people, such as potters, shoemakers, and blacksmiths. Andrew Jackson was born in a log cabin and enthusiastically promoted his idea of the self-made man. The notion that people can rise from humble beginnings to accomplish marvelous things through discipline and hard work. He lived quite grandly in this large mansion at his plantation called the Hermitage outside Nashville, Tennessee, and he owned over a hundred slaves. Andrew Jackson was nicknamed Old Hickory because of his toughness and his stubborn disposition. He often vetoed, that is overruled, bills passed by Congress, and he was sometimes accused of acting like a king when he replaced longtime federal officials with his own supporters and when he ignored Supreme Court decisions with which he did not agree. Can I make you a sandwich? 
Sue was a, a typical Southern American born in South Carolina because he was orphaned early, raised by his uh, older brother. And during the American Revolution, at age 13, he, along with his brother, is going to be captured uh, and put in prison by the British. One British colonel, uh, Bannister Tarleton, came up to him and demanded that Jackson shine his boots. Jackson knelt down and then looked up and then spit on Tarleton, who then drew his, drew his sword and slashed him across the face. Now, Jackson uh, would be scarred for life, not just physically, but also emotionally. And he hated the British for the rest of his life. And his actions, particularly uh, during his military career, would tend to bear that out. If there's one person that softened Jackson, and there's one person who he was utterly devoted to, it would be his wife, Rachel. I tell you, I don't get no respect, no respect at all. And that's the way she felt. Rachel uh, had married a man prior to his, her marriage with Jackson. And uh, one day, man came home, said, listen, honey, I'm going out to the store. And five years later, still had not come back. So Jackson began courting her, and the two of them got married. And on their wedding day, guess who came back from the store? That's right, her long-lost husband. Well, immediately, people uh, then started calling her uh, a whore, a uh, prostitute, a uh, bigamist, uh, etc. Well, of course, none of that was true, but it made no difference. It deeply wounded her and angered Jackson. They would uh, withdraw from their, their marriage. She would receive a legitimate divorce, and then they would finally be, quote unquote, legally married. But after that, uh, the reputation that she had already accrued stuck with her. And that was going to lead Jackson to fight many a duel in her honor. You ever met anybody you didn't kill? Well, I haven't killed you yet. Now, one such individual that Jackson uh, ran afoul of would be an individual by the name of Charles Dickinson. While in Nashville, one of the uh, entertaining things that people did was to race horses. And Jackson and Dickinson's horses squared off down Main Street. Now it was a close race and Dickinson's horse won. Dickinson turned to Jackson and said, it's no wonder uh, since the horse that you're racing looks a little bit like your wife. Well, that immediately angered Jackson, challenged Dickinson to a duel, which was a major mistake. Dickinson was the top duelist in the Western states and he readily accepted. Now, Dueling was illegal in Tennessee at that time, and they vowed to meet the next morning in a hollow glen uh, in Kentucky. Jackson went home, packed his bag, got in touch with one of his best friends, who would then serve as his second to make sure that everything was done according to the rules of dueling, uh, and then kissed his wife goodbye. Rode out around five o'clock in the morning to the uh, valley in Kentucky where the two of them would meet. So as is typical, back to back, walked 10 paces, turned, aimed, and then the pledge, or I should say the uh, call for fire took place. Jackson wore an old Navy coat. He turned sideways as you see in the picture to present a smaller target which was typical, and the coat seemed to throw off Dickinson's aim. He looked, swore that he had struck Jackson square, but Jackson never moved. Now, what in fact happened was he did hit Jackson. It went right into his lung, and the riding boots that Jackson was wearing would fill up with blood and start to overflow, but Jackson demanded his turn. He fired, misfired, Everybody said, okay, that's it. Honor has been served. Jackson said, no, 
aimed again and fired and caught Dickinson square between the eyes, leaving Dickinson's wife and seven children without a husband or a father. Jackson would then mount his horse, ride about 200 yards and collapse. It was going to take him some two years to recover from that wound. And he would carry around Dickinson's bullet in his lungs for the rest of his life, causing him many problems. One of the uh, famous duels that Jackson took place in involved uh, a duel with a future United States Senator. And later on, during Jackson's presidency, when he went out to lunch with that Senator, all of a sudden he winced and a bullet fell out of Jackson's shoulder and onto the plate that Jackson was eating from. Jackson picked up the bullet, looked at the Senator and said, here, I think this belongs to you. The Senator looked at the bullet and said, no, you keep it. When I gave it to you, it was meant to be permanent. Now, Jackson's fame throughout the country was due to his military actions. Early on in the uh, War of 1812, he would automatically uh, raise a volunteer force and in the Alabama, West Florida area, right against the Creeks, and particularly a group known as the Red Sticks. And this would be famous. They are all in a walk visit all the life of Davy Crockett. Later on, of course, the famous Battle of New Orleans, which was the biggest battle uh, that America involved itself in during the War of 1812. Later on, around 1818, James Monroe, as you already know, sent Jackson down to stop the flight flames across the border into Florida. And Dr. the Seminoles coming into Georgia. Well, Jackson did just that, went a little bit further than that. Got to conquer Florida, which he did. As you already know, Jackson ran for president in 1824 and in a rather controversial election, lost to John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams, uh, a brilliant man in his own right, but not having the uh, political acumen of people like Jackson and more like just like his father uh, botched everything if you remember by appointing Henry Clay as the Secretary of State which led to the corrupt bargain charge. He runs for re-election in 1828 once again facing Jackson and of course this time it's totally different. Jackson wins in a landslide but this was going to be a precursor of things to come. This would be the dirtiest election in American history up to that date. The political mud was thrown all over the place. One of the things that Jackson's people accused John Quincy Adam of was being the pimp for the czar of Russia. It seems that when Adams was our ambassador to Russia, uh, he was accused of procuring teenage girls for the czar. Well, nothing could be further the truth, but nonetheless, that stuck. But Adams was not, was not uh, above using a little political uh, mud of his own. His people accused Jackson of being an out and out killer and pointed out all the people that Jackson had killed in duels and having teenagers executed for falling asleep on duty during the war of 1812. But as we already know, I'll be back. It was back. And he wins the election of 1828 rather handily. And now his new party, the Jacksonian Democrats, soon to be simply called just the Democrats, had uh, was controlling of the various means of government, both houses of Congress and now the presidency. In his inaugural address, Jackson makes a statement. And in that statement, he says, only I am right. So it was either going to be his way or the proverbial highway. 
He will bring with him some advisors that will become known as his kitchen cabinet, not to be confused with the regular cabinet, Secretary of State, Secretary of War, uh, etc. These kitchen cabinet people got their name because in the executive mansion on Friday nights, Jackson would host a poker game where he and his friends would sit down and besides playing poker, hash out various political strategies. So his kitchen cabinet, which did include some of his regular cabinet members, uh, becomes his go-to guys when he needs advice in political matters. Six presidents, the government functioned pretty much like the founding fathers planned. But our seventh president, Andrew Jackson, had an entirely new vision of how things should work. First of all, he thought that the people should elect the president. Jackson and his supporters decided to reinvent American politics. So they organized all kinds of popular demonstrations, uh, rallies, conventions, uh, assemblies of people who would get together and hurrah for Jackson. And this was the kind of tactic that didn't require finagling behind closed doors. It could take place in the boondocks. It could happen in rural Tennessee, rural Alabama, uh, rural New York. And this kind of uh, stirring up popular vote and giving the people the notion that they should choose the president and not the uh, caucus members in Washington that revolutionized American politics. The people have not been willing to give up the choice of president ever since. Jackson also thought that the man the people chose to be president should dominate American politics. Andrew Jackson was the first modern president because he was the first one who asserted that the president was not merely a member of a government symphony, he was its conductor. He said, I am the only person elected by all the people, and therefore I have a special role in leadership, in setting a direction for the country, in imposing my will on the legislature or the court if I wish, and if people don't like it, they can vote me out next time. But Jackson's vision deeply frightened many Americans. Men like Henry Clay worried about Andrew Jackson courting the will and, and sentiment of the people precisely because it was, in their mind, demagoguery. You whip the people into a frenzy over something which may or may not be true, and, uh, and then you ride their energy into office and then commit mayhem as you will. President Jackson's actions would only feed Clay's fears for it was his goal to make himself into the most powerful president America ever had. Andrew Jackson's first strategy for increasing the power of the president was to fire hundreds of federal employees and replace them with his own supporters. Now, you should start to see some similarities between Andrew Jackson and his concepts and that of Donald Trump. And the same idea, the same fears that people had, this demagoguery that would take place when you would appeal to your supporters in over to thwart the will of anybody that stood in your way. Jackson saw himself, as you see at the top of the screen, as steward of the people. As he said, I am the only individual elected by all the people. And of course, that's true. State. United States senators, members of Congress and the House of Representatives are all elected by a much, much smaller constituency. Not so the president. And that's why Jackson saw himself as a person who serves the will of the people. Now, at times, that's what you should do. But there are other times when you should be leading ahead of that curve. And many people felt that Jackson was appealing to uh, populist ideas rather than moral ideas. And of course, that's the same charge that would be leveled against Donald Trump. As the people's president, uh, Jackson was always in the public eye, which is why the one 
uh, professor you saw there on that film clip referred to uh, Jackson as the people's president, elected by all the people. Here you see what happened on Inauguration Day. Washington at that time was a small town. Uh, you couldn't even refer to it as a city. Uh, maybe with uh, a population of under a thousand. On the day of Jackson's swearing in, over 10,000 people showed up. They wanted to see their Andy sworn in. And then they swarmed the White House for a post inaugural party. So much so that they went inside, they were swinging from the chandeliers, stepping on the couches, uh, using the curtains to wipe off their uh, mud covered boots. Jackson silently slipped away from this uh, fiasco. And the only thing that saved the day was the American military, the army, but not by force. What they did was they carried all the vats of whiskey outside. And of course the people automatically followed. And that's what saved the White House from being destroyed again, first by the British and this time by the American people. Later on, uh, late in Jackson's second term of office, an admirer sent a one ton block of cheese to the White House. It was deposited in the lobby. And when visitors came, as you see there, they would cut themselves a chunk of cheese. And of course the White House smelled like cheese for a long, long time thereafter. So who was Jackson? Well, take a look, one historian referred to, a patriot and a traitor, a great general, wholly ignorant of war, writer, brilliant, elegant, eloquent, but he didn't know how to spell and couldn't uh, put together a correct statement. He was a statesman who never framed a single law. He was capable of the profoundest lies. He was law obeying and law defying, an atrocious saint. As you see at the bottom, when Jackson was asked what his biggest regret was, he said, not being able to shoot Henry Clay. And he meant it. That was Andy Jackson. That's what made him feared. And that's what made him extremely popular with the American people. And remember, popular doesn't mean correct or right. One of the first things he introduces is something that had been around for a long, long time. It would later be referred to as the spoils system comes from an old Latin saying used uh, to identify victorious Roman generals. To the victor belongs the spoils. You get everything. Well, Jackson interpreted this to mean that he got all of the federal jobs at his disposal. So he fired almost a thousand individuals and appointed them with his loyalists, people who either A, had given him money, B, had voted for him, and there is no C. In other words, he didn't necessarily appoint you because you were qualified for the job. You just needed to be either A or B. And this was something that uh, was either a positive or a negative. The two Adamses. Both kept people in jobs uh, that should not have been there. And that was their political undoing in certain respects. Jackson was going to make sure that that didn't happen to him. And by invoking this idea, of course, the government and the people in it were going to be extremely loyal to him because they're beholding to him for his jobs. Now, despite the criticisms of that, only 919 people, as you see on the screen, were appointed. But yet, keep in mind, the government at that time was still not that big. So it did have a significant impact. Uh, Trump uh, eviscerated the government. 
and appointed thousands of his employees, many of whom the, the current president, Joe Biden, is getting rid of as we speak. Now, one of the first instances of what Jackson's president was going to be like was going to involve a sex controversy, if you will. It's known as the Eaton Affair. It involved this woman. Her name was Peggy O'Neill. Peggy uh, was the daughter of an innkeeper in the Georgetown section of Washington, D.C. She uh, would marry a sailor in the United States Navy by the name of uh, Lieutenant Commander O'Neill. They uh, would see each other occasionally because, again, O'Neill oftentimes was at sea. Peggy then worked at her dad's inn, uh, dispensing drinks and sandwiches, and as some people charged other things. Well, she eventually uh, becomes the object of the Secretary of the Navy, a man by the name of John Eaton. Eaton uh, courts Peggy actively, even while Peggy is still married. But remember, He's the Secretary of the Navy. So he keeps sending O'Neill's ship out uh, on various missions, parting the husband and wife. Well, eventually, O'Neill is going to design, uh, die from uh, pneumonia while overseas, leaving Peggy free to marry John Eaton. This flies in the face of uh, propriety in the Washington society as small as it was. And that society would be led by the vice president of the United States wife. Do not now, uh, Mrs. O'Neill uh, would not let poor Rudolph play in all the reindeer games. She uh, and the rest of Washington society constantly shunned Peggy O'Neill Eaton. And finally, this comes to the attention of Andrew Jackson. Now, why would Jackson care and why would he get involved? Well, let's go back to his beloved wife, Rachel. She too would be shunned by Tennessee society as a result of the uh, mistaken marriage. As a matter of fact, at the conclusion of the election of 1828, uh, his wife, Rachel, who had never left their mansion, the Hermitage, during the entire campaign, would die before Jackson gets sworn in as president. And Jackson, on her certificate of death, read that the cause of death was died of a broken heart. And who does he blame for that? Well, John Quincy Adams, of course. Henry Clay, and John C. Calhoun, who headed up the opposition to Jackson's presidency. So now, here he is in office, sees what Peggy O'Neill Eaton is going through, recalls to mind the problems of his wife, and he immediately calls Mrs. Calhoun, along with the other matrons of Washington society, into the White House and demands that they start including Peggy in their activities. She refuses. She's not, or Jackson's now not sure exactly what to do, but there is somebody that will insert himself in between those two. Do not go in there. Woo! That man, Secretary of State Martin Van Buren. Van Buren gives Jackson the idea that you want to get rid of all these people? It's simple. I'm going to resign as Secretary of State. You then can simply ask for the resignation of the rest of your cabinet, getting rid of not only the husbands, but also the matrons that went with them. And so Van Buren will resign. Jackson really, in effect, fires the rest of his cabinet. 
Then, as a result of another incident, which we'll talk about in a second, Calhoun resigns. Jackson makes Martin Van Buren his vice president, and thus ended the Eaton Affair. <laughs> Old Peggy O'Neill, however, uh, would never be accepted by Washington society because of all the things that uh, she was accused of. And not only that, she had a very grating personality. As you see there, if you read her quote, uh, she never apologized for anything. She says, I put it to the candor of the world, whether the slanders which have been uttered against me are to be believed. So she doesn't flat out deny it, but she, of course, attacks those who accuse her. Again, one of the tactics during the Trump administration. Now, the incident which was going to further split apart president and vice president would be the tariff of abominations. Fredo, you're my older brother and I love you. But don't ever take sides with anyone against the family again. Ever. And what was Jackson referring to using those lines from The Godfather? Well, it was simple. John C. Calhoun, president, vice president of the United States, had anonymously written about the tariff of abominations in a South Carolina newspaper. And in his anonymous essay, he invokes the ideas that came from Jefferson and Madison on nullification, saying that the individual states could nullify the tariff. And he tells his own state of South Carolina, don't collect it. And if anybody does anything about it in the federal government, we shall leave the union. What makes the hot and so hot? The apron, apron cost. What they got I ain't got? Courage. You could say that again. It's Jackson versus Calhoun. At the Jefferson Day dinner in February. Of 1831, you have a long, long table in the White House set to receive some 60 people. Sitting at the head of the table would be Andrew Jackson. Sitting to his right on a corner of the table would be Calhoun. Jackson stands up and proposes a toast, and then looking down at Calhoun straight in the eye. And again, calling to mind Calhoun's anonymous essay, South Carolina's Exposition and Protest, Jackson proposes a toast and says, liberty and union, it must be preserved. Well, Jackson has thrown down the gauntlet. Calhoun now stands up, his hand shaking, and he says, liberty and union but not above the rights of the people. So battle lines are drawn and it looks like South Carolina might just leave the union. At that same time, a debate will take place in Congress. One of the most famous debates ever held. Daniel Webster of Massachusetts versus Robert Hayne from, once again, South Carolina. This, however, was not over the tariff. This dealt itself with the issue of land and whether states could should control all the Western land. Well, the debate is going to draw thousands to see these two oratorical giants square off against one another. Eventually, Daniel Webster will stand up and issue the very famous cry, United States and the Constitution, one and inseparable, now and forever. <laughs> 
They were both arguing in response to a resolution provided by Connecticut. Connecticut wanted to limit the sale of Western lands. Now, the reason Connecticut wished to do that was not because of the uh, expansion of slavery or any such thing. New England was against American expansion because New England was losing many of its sons and daughters who were now providing labor in the newly arisen factory system throughout New England. So they wanted to stop that migration. On the other hand, you have uh, Hain arguing that individual states should control the sale of lands. He's pushing the concept of state rights. Now, what was this all about? States' rights and nullification. The nullification crisis that nearly broke apart the United States was actually more about states' rights than it was about paying taxes. This was a theory quite popular among the powerful owners of big southern slave plantations. People who feared that the federal government was about to outlaw slavery without their approval. Under the strong states' rights system they favored, a state would be able to overturn a federal law, such as a law that bans slavery, if the state believed the law was unconstitutional. However, the U.S. Supreme Court did not agree with their interpretation of the law. Money was behind much of the debate over states' rights, because plantation owners were worried they would lose some of their wealth if they had to start paying their workers. And they were right to worry, because by the mid-1830s, slavery had been banned not only in the northern free states and territories, but in Canada and Mexico as well. There had always been a strong sentiment against slavery in the northern states, partly because that was where all the abolitionists lived. Abolitionists were people who actively worked to abolish or get rid of slavery. The most famous abolitionist of Jackson's time was William Lloyd Garrison of Massachusetts, who founded the very influential American Anti-Slavery Society in 1833. So this major issue during the time of Jackson uh, was revolving around slavery. Now, the irony, of course, is don't forget, Jackson himself was a major slaveholder. So he didn't look at it from that standpoint. He looked at the primacy of the national government over state. And of course, who headed that national government? Well, of course, that was him. So this was a personal battle Jackson conducted to increase his own power and to get rid of the man who he partially blamed for the death of his wife. And that, of course, was John C. Calhoun. Enter into the fray would be Henry Clay. Clay proposes another compromise. And that compromise would be the end of the tariff of abominations and the promise of the Southern states not to leave the Union. This would be done behind the scenes. It looked like Jackson had won, but in fact, so did Calhoun. The next problem that was going to be faced by the Jackson administration was of their own making and it involved the American Indians. And it eventually would become known as the Trail of Tears. Jackson had always been anti-Indian. Remember, much of his military fame came around his dealing with the Indians uh, in that portion of Georgia and Alabama. But Jackson's great victory at New Orleans was partially the result of an alliance with Cherokee Indians who fought by his side and who he promised to take care of. However, the Cherokees, who had uh, become assimilated, if you will, into American society, living in the uh, northwestern corner of Georgia, uh, they had developed their own alphabet. They had uh, gone to farming. They had adopted white dress. Uh, and 
when gold supposedly was discovered on their land, uh, they refused to sell. So under Jackson's uh, Indian Removal Act, they were told they had to get out. So what they eventually did was they would fight it. Ah, not the way you would think. They would fight it in the United States Supreme Court. One of the first big challenges Andrew Jackson faced as president concerned the rights of American Indians. Back then, pressure from white settlers and real estate speculators had led the states of Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi to seize Native American farmlands. And even though these actions clearly violated federal treaties, President Jackson did nothing to stop them. On the contrary, in 1830, he helped push the Indian Removal Act through Congress. The Indian Removal Act required five eastern tribes, the Cherokee, the Creek, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, and the Seminole to abandon their farms and move far to the west to what was called the Indian Territory, which is now in the state of Oklahoma. When the Cherokees appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, the court affirmed that the seizure of Indian lands by the states was illegal. Nevertheless, the tribes were forced off their lands anyway. All the tribes suffered enormously due to the Indian Removal Act. But for the Cherokees, things were especially bad. U.S. troops rounded up 15,000 Cherokee men, women, and children and put them in military stockades. Then, under armed guard, the Cherokees were marched off to the Indian Territory, a distance of some 1,200 miles, or 2,000 kilometers. This event has come to be called the Trail of Tears, because when it was over, 4,000 Cherokees had died of starvation and disease. Ironically, White Path, the Cherokee warrior chief, buried here on the Trail of Tears, was once awarded a medal for helping Andrew Jackson during a dangerous battle. The Cherokees took it to the Supreme Court in a case known as Worcester versus Georgia. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court at that time was still John Marshall. Marshall Cole, they did not have to leave that in Worcester versus Georgia, the government was in violation of a contract, or in this case, a treaty. Jackson's reply to this decision was simply, well, Mr. Marshall has made his decision. Now let's see him try to enforce it. Of course, enforcement was supposed to be something the chief executive did, which of course Jackson did not. And instead, the resulting trail of tears and the loss of almost half of the Indian or the Cherokees on this infamous journey. One of the things the Cherokees would take with them, board by board, would be the Baptist church that they worshiped at. They would take that and reassemble it in Oklahoma, where it still stands today, the original church. That was how thoroughly they had integrated themselves into white life, but it was not to be accepted when there was land at stake. The ancestors of Native Americans settled in North America many thousands of years ago. They made homes for themselves and created a way of life. But starting in the 1600s, European settlers landed on their shores. They claimed areas for villages, towns, and farms. Those areas had once been used by Native Americans, but as the settlers moved in, the Indians were forced out. The Cherokee people had once dominated what is now the South Central United States. But by the end of the 1700s, they had lost two-thirds of their land in conflicts with the British and American governments. The Cherokees tried to keep what was left of their land by adopting the ways of their new neighbors. They began farming. Many lived in log cabins and used spinning wheels. They hoped to live in harmony with the white settlers. Although some settlers were willing to live in peace with the Cherokees, others did not want to accept them as their neighbors. And many simply wanted the Cherokees' land, 
By the early 1800s, most white Americans, even those sympathetic to the Native Americans, believed they should be moved west of the Mississippi River. The Cherokees decided to transform their own government and use the United States Constitution as their model. They chose John Ross as their chief. The Cherokee Nation moved its capital to northwestern Georgia, but Georgia refused to recognize the Cherokee government. The state outlawed their constitution and enacted a law giving it the right to claim Cherokee lands. In the late 1820s, gold was discovered on the Cherokee land. The new find made those lands even more desirable to whites. President Andrew Jackson proposed Indian removal legislation, which made it easy for Georgia to move the Cherokees off this valuable land. On May 23, 1830, Congress passed Jackson's Indian Removal Act. Then Georgia swiftly passed similar legislation. It stripped the Cherokees of their civil rights and gave them six months to dissolve their nation. John Ross took the Cherokee Nation's protest to President Jackson. He tried to persuade the president to stop the Georgia law. His appeal failed. The Cherokees then took their case to the federal courts. In March 1832, the Supreme Court found Georgia's legislation unconstitutional. The state, it said, had no authority over Native Americans. Jackson ignored the ruling. He said the court would have to find a way to enforce its decision. He would not. Eventually, Jackson struck a deal with an influential Cherokee, John Ridge. Although Ridge had no authority, he gave the president what white Americans wanted, he agreed to hand over all the Cherokee land east of the Mississippi in exchange for $5 million. The deal was made formal in a treaty. The Cherokees had two years to prepare to leave the land of their ancestors. Two years later, time had run out for the Cherokees. On May 23, 1838, a military roundup began. Army troops took the Cherokees from their homes and put them in stockades. Without sufficient food, water, sanitation, and medical supplies, approximately 2,000 died there. John Ross convinced the new president, Martin Van Buren, to let the Cherokee Nation handle their move west. And so the Cherokees started to prepare for their long journey. As 17,000 men, women, and children gathered their belongings, winter was closing in. Summer heat gave way to icy rains, and the ground began to freeze. General Winfield Scott and his 7,000 men watched as the Cherokee people carrying everything they owned began a nearly 850-mile march to what is now the state of Oklahoma. On the way, more than 4,000 Cherokees died. Most of those who perished were children and the elderly. The journey came to be called the Trail of Tears. White Americans got the land they wanted and the Cherokees lost 6,000 people and every last acre of their traditional homeland. Davy Crockett, who becomes an American icon, uh, had scouted for Jackson, had helped him during his war against the Creeks during the War of 1812, uh, had in his own right been elected to Congress. And when he saw Jackson's treatment of the Indians, well, you can see what he says. I will never come and go and fetch and carry at the whistle of the great man in the White House, no matter who he is. Stop and think about some of the men in Congress, some Republicans, who said almost that very same thing about Donald Trump. So, what have we seen about Jackson so far? The spoils system becomes a powerful instrument for motivating political participation at the grassroots level. In other words, individuals who had not been, been considered for government uh, employee previously were now looking at it as a possible avenue. The Eaton problem, and again, Democratic Party resisting moral standards. And then the Indian Removal Act set a pattern for geographical expansion and white supremacy. It becomes part of, if you will, manifest destiny. 
the biggest war or battle that he fights during the presidency will be his war on the Bank of the United States. A battle which in effect was promoted by the bank itself. Jackson coming from the West had little um, trust in Eastern banks. This goes all the way back to the time uh, of Shays' Rebellion. Westerners not trusting the, the Eastern money people. And Jackson was silently biding his time until the bank's charter uh, would expire. However, the election of 1832, Henry Clay decides to make the bank an issue, thinking the American people would be behind him. So Clay proposes to the director of the bank, Nicholas Biddle, the bank was headquartered in Philadelphia. And if you're ever up in Philly around 3rd and Chestnut, you'll see the huge uh, edifice standing there directly across the street from the new museum of the American Revolution. But Clay persuades Biddle to apply early for the bank to be rechartered. It didn't need to be, to re didn't need to be rechartered for another two or three years. So Biddle applies for a charter. You see Jackson's response at the top, unless the corrupting monster should be shraven with its ill-gotten power, my veto will meet it frankly and fearlessly. So this was Jackson's attack on the bank, Jackson's attack on the aristocracy, and particularly Biddle and Clay. There you see in that political cartoon, Jackson riding his horse, chasing Biddle, and about to trip over the rock that was the Bank of the United States. Eventually, Congress investigates Jackson's claims against the bank and demands that Jackson turn over certain paperwork. Jackson refuses. You see what he says, you are a den of vipers and thieves. I intend to rout you out and by the eternal God, I will rout you out. Jackson is censored by Congress, led by Henry Clay, because he won't turn over the information. Sound familiar? We have a president of the United States who has just left, who did that very same thing and wouldn't let certain people testify in either impeachment hearings or other investigations. Jackson issues his veto message on the rechartering of the Bank of the United States. Take a look at what he says there in red. When the laws undertake to add to these natural advantages, artificial distinctions, to give titles, gratuities, and privileges, to make the rich richer and the potent more powerful, the humble members of society, of the farmers, mechanics, and laborers, who have neither the time nor the means of securing like favorites to themselves have a right to complain of the injustice of their government. In other words, Jackson, a la Trump, is appealing to what we would call today the blue collar worker. And he's saying that I am your savior. I am your champion, your crusader. And so people line up behind him. So he vetoes the recharter it will be passed over his veto. Eighteen thirty-two, the last year of Andrew Jackson's first term, was a pivotal year in his presidency. After fighting petticoats, Indians, and secessionists, he suddenly faced his most daunting enemy, the Bank of the United States. The bank war was absolutely the central political uh, controversy of his administration. The bank war began in the summer of 1832, when Congress, led by Henry Clay, renewed the bank's charter, even though it wasn't due to expire until 1836. Clay pushed the bill through for political reasons and presented it to Jackson on the 4th of July. It's not immediately clear that Andrew Jackson has a problem with the bank. But once Henry Clay involves himself, 
uh, in the bank recharter, then suddenly it becomes a battle royal uh, that Jackson has to involve himself in. Henry Clay was also running for president that year, and he was supported by the president of the Bank of the United States, a man named Nicholas Biddle. Both Clay and Biddle believed they could force Jackson to sign the bank bill. If he didn't, Clay would crush his bid for re-election. But the old general outflanked them. He's told that there is a cabal uh, between Biddle and Henry Clay. And once Jackson thinks of the bank in those terms, um, then this is something that absolutely has to be vanquished in his mind. It becomes, uh, in his term, the hydra-headed monster. He said to Van Buren, the bank is trying to kill me, and I will kill it. Typical of Jackson, he personified the bank fight by waging war against one man, Nicholas Biddle. Jackson saw Biddle not only as his own personal enemy, but the enemy of the people. The United States of America wasn't big enough for both Andrew Jackson and Nicholas Biddle. Jackson vetoed the bank bill, returning it with a simple yet powerful note in which he stated, the bill to continue the Bank of the United States was presented to me on the 4th of July. Having considered it with that solemn regard to the principles of the Constitution which the day was calculated to inspire, and come to the conclusion that it ought not to become a law, I herewith return it to the Senate, in which it originated with my objections. Nicholas Biddle called Jackson's veto a manifesto of anarchy. Jackson called it his mandate for re-election. Jackson saw this as an opportunity to strike out for the power of the ordinary citizen by smashing what he called the monster bank. So, Jackson, in the name of the people, vetoes the bank. Now, what happens after that? Well... King Andrew, as he is oftentimes referred to back in that time period, will win election overwhelmingly on the issue of the bank. So the strategy of Clay and Biddle totally backfires. Now, you still have the bank and it's been rechartered. However, Jackson intends to starve the bank. How? Well, think about it. What feeds a bank? And it's money. So he automatically tells his secretary of the treasury, I want you to uh, take all the government money out of the bank of the United States. Treasury refuses saying, I can't do that. It doesn't say I can do that in the constitution. Jackson fires him. He goes to the assistant secretary of the treasury, tells him to do the same thing. Guy says, I can't. Doesn't say I can do it in the Constitution. Jackson fires him. Finally, he goes to the third guy on the list and says, I want you to do it. He says, no problem. And takes the funds needed for the Bank of the United States and then redistributes them to what becomes known as Jackson's pet banks. Banks that were friendly to Jackson, most of them out west. Now, this is going to prove to be a disastrous mistake because now all these banks out west have newfound money. And with the death by starvation of the Bank of the United States, there's no regulating authority. So they start loaning out money like crazy because it's newfound money that they didn't have before. You know, it's just like you walking down the street, finding a $10 bill. Are you going to put it in your bank account? No, you're going to spend it right away. It's money you didn't have. Well, that's what this was. It was newfound money for these banks. And they go out making rather shaky loans to people who are not going to be able to pay them back. But Jackson has accomplished his goal and he has starved the Bank of the United States. Another event during his presidency, which he was not directly involved with, but nevertheless will have dramatic long-term effects. The bloodiest slave revolt 
in American history. It takes place around 1831, led by a slave in Virginia by the name of Nat Turner. Turner uh, was taught to read and write by the mistress of the plantation. And on Sundays, the the uh, owner of the plantation allowed him to preach the Bible to slaves in various areas. Well, what Turner was really preaching was revolution. And as you see there in August of 1831, that revolution takes place. Now remember, slaves did not know how to use guns. So using swords, uh, axes, saws, they uh, pitchforks, they would wind up killing some uh, 50 people. Eventually, they would all be uh, captured. Turner uh, would be captured, put on trial, and hung as a traitor. But nonetheless, this was going to have a chilling impact on the South. They believed that Turner was inspired by Northern influences. So they put up, if you will, almost their own uh, iron curtain, uh, keeping Northerners and seditious material as they turned it out of the South and increasing the severity of the laws governing slaves. Jacksonian democracy is a term that's going to evolve from this time period. What was it? Well, increased voter participation, total end of property qualification, anybody, who was a citizen, male and white would be allowed to vote. The end of the party caucus. A caucus is a secret meeting behind closed doors. And it was at that party caucus that candidates would be chosen. Backroom deals as they were referred to. Now these would be chosen more along the lines of what you're used to. And that of course would be political conventions vote by the people's representatives. Giving average people government jobs, increasing their participation in their own governing. And the rise of the West. Think about it. Clay, who ran for office, is from Kentucky, a new state, the West. Jackson from Tennessee, a new state and the West. No longer was the Massachusetts and Virginia uh, domination going to continue. And the rise of the mass political party. And now the move westward. And the rise of the American dream. Every man can get land and become a success. But with the Shortly death of after Martin Van Buren was sworn in as president in 1837, the year Michigan became a state, an economic disaster struck the nation. The Panic of 1837 resulted from the abrupt closure of a large number of American banks. These bank failures plunged the United States into the first major depression or severe economic downturn in its history. But the disaster President Van Buren confronted was not of his making and can be traced back to the actions of his predecessor, Andrew Jackson. For Jackson had attempted to destroy the Bank of the United States, the well-established private bank that handled the money of the federal government and that was run by his political enemies. This bank also oversaw the activities of America's small state banks. Jackson used his power as president to veto, that is override, the law that allowed the Bank of the United States to operate and he ordered that all the government's money be withdrawn from it. As a result, responsible oversight of the activities of America's banking industry was lost. 
Jackson's actions made it much easier for banks to make risky loans to unscrupulous land speculators, people who bought and sold government land to make a profit. In the 1830s, small banks issued their own paper money to make loans. It was supposed to be backed up with gold or silver equal to its face value, but it rarely was. Banks make money by charging interest fees for loans. The more loans they make, the more interest they are paid. But back then, the amount of paper money the banks loaned out greatly exceeded their gold and silver reserves. When ordinary American citizens heard about this situation, they panicked and tried to withdraw their money from the banks as gold or silver coins. But the bankers either offered them worthless paper money or else turned them away. Soon the banks shut down. People lost their life savings. Businesses failed. Unemployment soared. And soon the entire American economy collapsed. President Van Buren was blamed for not fixing the nation's money problems. And in the election of 1840, Van Buren, a Democrat, was defeated in a landslide by William Henry Harrison, a member of the Whig Party, a political party originally formed to oppose Andrew Jackson. However, in April of 1841, after only one month in office, Harrison, the ninth U.S. president, died of pneumonia, and as specified by law, his vice president, John Tyler, automatically became the 10th president of the United States. One of the things that had aggravated this situation was before Jackson left office, he proposed and had passed another bill called the Species Circular Act. This act said that all land sold by the government must be paid for in cold, hard cash. In other words, gold. That being the case, people that wanted to buy land were taking gold out of these banks. So when this run on the banks took place, there was no gold to back up the paper money that they had been issuing. Now it was totally worthless. So it was Jackson's actions, A, the closing of the Bank of the United States as a regulatory institution, and B, the Species Circular Act, which caused this economic collapse of the economy. One of the controversies uh, and interesting ideas that surrounded Jackson would be that and the relationship to a female slave he had by the name of Hannah. Hannah had been taken in by Jackson when she was about eight or nine years old. She had been orphaned and Jackson uh, found her and took her to the plantation where she would serve almost until her death. Uh, she was extremely loyal to him. She was a house servant, constantly around Jackson, his wife, her, and, and children. Hannah fiercely defended Jackson until the Civil War. Jackson by now had long passed away. And later on, when Jackson's family asked her to go with him, she said no. And uh, she talked about some of the brutality that took place on Jackson's Hermitage Plantation. So who was Andrew Jackson? Worshiped by the people from the time he set forth on the public stage until his death. His beloved wife, Rachel, which of course that controversy would result in many duels, his military fame, the two national elections that he took place in, his handling of the Peggy Eaton affair, the bank and the species circular, and of course, nullification. All of these things were populist battles. All of these things Jackson made personal. It's not the ideas behind them. It was the individuals that he fought against. Again, no different than Trump uh, attaching nicknames to people that he fought against. In 1859, as America was rushing towards civil war, James Parton, 
the first historian to attempt a biography of Andrew Jackson, arrived at the Hermitage, Jackson's beloved home. He was escorted through the mansion by Hannah Jackson, who had been Andrew Jackson's slave from the time she was 10 until Jackson died. Parton knew that many Americans considered Andrew Jackson the country's greatest leader since the Founding Fathers. Parton wrote, During the last 30 years of his life, he was the idol of the American people. Columbus had sailed. Washington fought. Jefferson written. Fifty years of democratic government had passed. And the result of it all was that the people of the United States honored Andrew Jackson before all other living men. Andrew Jackson, in my mind, is one of the great presidents. And it's not surprising that he was so loved. In fact, it is said that when the Civil War broke out in 1861, people wanted to vote for Andrew Jackson hoping he would come back and save the Union. He was that beloved. For all of his flaws, for all of his contradictions, Andrew Jackson did more than any other American of his generation to enlarge the possibilities of American democracy. In doing that, in seeing himself as president, as the tribune of the people, he did more than anyone to change to enlarge the possibilities of the American presidency. But Jackson was also one of the most controversial presidents in American history. His policies on issues like Indian removal and slavery provoked fierce opposition, not only in his lifetime, but beyond. Andrew Jackson for African Americans is not the sort of figure uh, that one holds very dear. He wouldn't form part of the, the ranks of the great men uh, of American society because never in his reign as president, in his terms as president, did he ever attempt to expand the rights of people. On the contrary, he did everything he could, it seems to me, to constrict those rights, to limit those rights. People talk about Andrew Jackson's black moods. People talk about Andrew Jackson's red-hot temper. But the color of this story is green, and it's the green of envy, and it's the green of coveting Indian lands. At the Hermitage, Parton discovered a portrait of Jackson finished just before he died. It was completely unlike the many heroic portraits of the great man, and the vulnerability it captured brought to life Parton's most insightful description of Jackson. He was a democratic autocrat, an urbane savage, an atrocious saint. Americans have always looked at Andrew Jackson and seen themselves. But over the years, they've looked at Andrew Jackson and seen different versions of themselves. At one time, they saw the frontiersman, the poor boy made good, the classic self-made man. Today, some Americans look back at Jackson and they see the slaveholder, the Indian oppressor, even the Indian hater. So the debate about Andrew Jackson is a very contemporary one. He's an inescapable, quintessential American, but of what kind? Uh, is he a man whom we should admire, or is he a man whom we should despise? Is he a man whom we should celebrate, or is he a man for whom we should apologize? All those questions surrounding Andrew Jackson's are one that you'll have to answer for yourself. If you get the opportunity, go to the module uh, history videos, take a look at the one on Andrew Jackson, and you might answer some of those questions.